still see myself on the video. Can someone confirm if that if my PowerPoint is sharing? Yes, no. Yes, it's great. OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so um, what I would like. So so what I'm kind of hoping to bring to um, the discussion of um, this conference generally um, is a slightly different perspective, one which rather than starting from Cyprus as an object of interest, places Cyprus within a the idea of a network of colonial archaeology going on in the Eastern Mediterranean more generally um, via the British Empire. Um, so just to kind of think about the setting for what I'm going to talk about, the idea of networks for studying um, uh, colonial activities generally. Um, they are an idea that's been used quite a lot in um, recent scholarship on the British Empire in various ways. Um, and in relation to archaeology, seeing them as pathways for knowledge, but also um, more literal, physical um, routes of connection between individuals that allow us to think about the links between people in colonial settings um, in a way that continues to demand that we think of the power differentials that are going on in colonial environments, but allow, but also allow for um, a, a sense that people have these um, encounters and connections, um, be they professional, be they personal. Um, there's a lot of particularly interesting work's been going on in terms of using these sorts of ideas for thinking about um, uh, archaeological activities, um, particularly in colonial environments. Amara's own work on uh, the students of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem is a, a brilliant example of this. Um, for a lot of reasons, those various studies tend to focus on the, the colonial end, the colonizer end um, of the activities. Um, they're the people who appear most in the documents. They're the ones who actually often publish research. They're in the most powerful positions. Um, and obviously, of course, the sources that they produce tend to be in the languages that academics um, uh, generally operate in as their primary languages, English, French, German, whatever. Um, whereas uh, the colonized figures within this, um, if they are writing, might well be doing it in languages that are harder to access. Um, the material that they produce that's evidence of their role in these networks might well um, be more subject to destruction, particularly in an example like um, Palestine, where of course you've got long periods of conflict as well. Um, but despite these limitations, um, what I'm arguing is that there are opportunities for taking micro history, biographical history approaches, which place them into these networks um, and thus give us um, a more complex image of what those networks are, who, are, who is involved in them, um, who is helping to produce knowledge, um, and also give us a bit of granularity in terms of these sort of tiny glimpses that we sometimes get from things like the slide that Stefan showed before with the lists of the names of workers um, and their rates of pay and things like this, that give us a little bit of a glimpse into the lives of colonized peoples. So just to give a little bit of background for, um, because of course this is a Cyprus conference and I'm talking about Palestine. Um, I'm talking about Palestinian archeologists who were working within the Department of Antiquities of the British Mandate Administration in Palestine. Um, this is an institution which is established very soon after um, General Allenby's military occupation of Palestine in World War I. Um, and we can see from records in places like the British National Archives 
that there is an interest and a concern about antiquities and religious sites by these military um, authorities very, very early on, even when they're, you know, only just um, sort of con uh, um, really kind of taking control of the region, they're already worried about um, about antiquities, archaeology, religious sites. So this department is established very quickly. Um, there are appointed from 1920 onwards regional inspectors of antiquities, um, but working under the control of a central department in Jerusalem, which um, initially is in a a fairly small house that it that it shares with the School of Archaeology um, and then from 1935 onwards is based at the Palestine Archaeological Museum, what is now the Rockefeller. Um, the majority, um, the leadership of the school is always British. It's very, very clear from the documentation um, that um, top positions are to be given to British men um, when they're, for instance, searching for um, people to occupy jobs. Uh, as we go into the sort of professional, um, educated, but not upper management roles, we see some British archeologists or librarians and things. Um, we also see educated, um, very, in some cases, very highly educated European Jews, some coming from, um, with, with, with things like PhDs from the University of Berlin and things like this. Um, and we also increasingly see during the mandate period, so up to 1948, um, educated Arab staff. And these largely come through a trainee student inspector scheme that is run by the department in which um, middle class Palestinians are um, given a kind of apprenticeship um, student inspector role. And then if they're successful, are promoted to insistent, assistant inspector and sometimes then to full and senior inspector positions. Um, so within Palestine itself, we have this range of uh, ethnic, religious, um, all sorts of different backgrounds to the staff of the Department of Antiquities. If we're thinking about this Department of Antiquities in terms of colonial networks, um, these are some of the um, British um, figures that we need to factor in to this. Um, so starting um, over here with the gentleman in the striped suit, this is Cedric Johns, who is um, a field archaeologist for the department for a long period during the mandate. Um, and he will be popping up later in the story here. Um, we've got then Robert Hamilton, who um, is at the department for a long period and is the last director of the department um, when it is handed over to the Jordanians in 1948. Um, this then is um, Harry Eilif, who works in the museum um, and who then um, excavates in Cyprus after 1948. Um, so he's one of the figures where there is a direct connection for, of people moving between Cyprus um, and Palestine. And then I would guess that um, for people who work on Cypriot archaeology, this is a very familiar figure, um, AHS um, Peter Megal, um, who was the uh, director of the department for a long period in the later colonial um, British, British rule of, of Cyprus. What doesn't appear in a lot of biographies of him, though, in things like obituaries, is that he also spent several periods in Palestine uh, um, looking at various um, sets of finds and things like this. And particularly, he was um, seconded for several months during 1945 to look at um, the, the, the safety and stability of particularly the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem because it had suffered um, several sets of damage in earthquakes in 1927 and 38. Uh, and because he had originally trained as an architect um, rather than specifically as an archeologist, he was sort of the nearest and best qualified um, person to come and look at 
a site like the Holy Sepulchre. Um, and I think he also looked uh, a little at um, the Al-Aqsa Mosque um, and to look at them with both the eye of an architect in terms of in, um, structural integrity, but then also um, as, as historic buildings um, and to consider them in terms of their, uh, of, of how renovation would be able to respect the integrity of that as well. So this is part of the, of the colonial stratum um, of what's going on here. But what I'm particularly interested in is the way that if we think about somewhere like Cyprus um, after 1948, um, with the, um, the war uh, of, um, between um, Arabs and um, initially Zionist forces and then the, the uh, new state of Israel um, after May 15th, 1948, we can also see this sense of a network functioning in relation to Palestinian archeologists. And this is where I think um, considering um, colonialism and questions of decolonization and decoloniality in terms of how we study archeology span becomes particularly interesting because we can also start to incorporate the, them into the networks. So going in the opposite direction, um, this is uh, Salam Abdus Salam Al Husseini, a member of uh, um, an elite uh, Muslim family. Um, he was one of the student inspectors and then becomes an inspector uh, and a senior inspector in his own right. He then, um, after 1948, becomes a refugee, uh, goes to Damascus initially and works for the UN, and then goes to work for Cedric Johns. Um, so the gentleman in the striped suit again, uh, in Libya, because um, when Libya is, um, when, when, when uh, a government is set up in Libya uh, after Italian colonialism is ended post-World War II, um, it's the British who go in and help to run, um, help to establish new departments of antiquities, replacing those that had been run by the Italians. Um, so uh, Al Husseini, uh, is one of several Palestinian archaeologists who um, work for Cedric Johns, um, who is appointed as the, the director of the Department of Antiquities of Cyrenica from 1950-51. Um, um, next, this young gentleman is uh, Ani uh, Adejani, another um, member of uh, a notable elite uh, Muslim family from Jerusalem. He is the last of the student inspectors. Um, and then um, after 1948, transitions into the Jordanian Department of Antiquities and ends up in the 1960s as the head of that department. Uh, at the bottom, um, surrounded by local workers um, from Khobit al mafjar or Hisham's Palace in Jericho, is the first of the official student inspectors, um, Dmitry Bramke, who is probably the most famous of them as well, mainly in terms of his work at Hisham's Palace. He briefly works for the um, British headed Jordanian Department of Antiquities after 1948, and then moves to Beirut to take up a professorship at the Arab, um, at the American University of Beirut. And then finally up here, we have a, a slight anomaly, but also the main connection to Cyprus from the, from the Palestinian um, stratum of this network. Um, this is Stefan Hanna Stefan, who only at the end of the uh, British rule of Palestine um, becomes an official employee of the Department of Antiquities, um, but actually spends his entire professional life there. He joins the department early in the 1920s um, because he is seconded there from the general civil service pool. Um, he has from very early on in the period, so possibly even before he joins the department, a record of publishing on the ethnography, the ancient history, culture, um, and um, kind of general anthropology of Palestine. Uh, so he already has these kind of interests and relevant skills. Um, and then he is the, on this sort of semi-permanent secondment um, where he works in the library, 
He sometimes helps to write up archaeological reports. He performs translations, particularly from Ottoman Turkish, but also from Arabic into English for the museum. Um, and after 1948, uh, he spends a fairly considerable amount of time um, in Cyprus, um, going back and forth between Beirut, where he becomes a refugee with his wife and children, including this little boy. This is one of his sons, um, Albert or Arthur. Um, uh, and there is actually um, an article that is uh, signed by um, Peter Megau, but which is which he notes is largely based on um, notations which had been taken by Stefan, who was looking at Arabic inscription, early Arabic inscriptions on Cyprus. Um, and um, his, I'm in touch with Stefan's granddaughters, um, and they also say that they remember there being large numbers of passport stamps in their father's passport from this period. Um, so this is kind of where Cyprus appears as a node in this network. Um, it doesn't last very long, unlike the um, Libyan uh, relationship, because um, Stefan dies young. He dies of a heart attack as a refugee in Beirut in 1949. But certainly what it looks like is that possibly due to maybe relationships that were established when Megal was in Jerusalem a couple of years earlier, possibly due to other relationships that had gone on on the colonial level, he was very much building some kind of relationship in Cyprus. And this map um, illustrates um, the trajectories of the various staff of the um, Palestine Department of Antiquities, um, the, pa the Palestinian staff. So um, the red line which goes um, up into Syria and then to Cyrenica and back to Jordan is Salam Abdul Husseini, uh, Abdul Salam Al Husseini. Um, Stefan's line is this purple one that goes up to Beirut and then loops back through Cyprus. Aouni Dejani and other staff who remained at the Jerusalem Museum under the Jordanians appear here. Dimitri Baramki um, heads off to Lebanon from Jerusalem. Um, the one name I haven't talked about yet is this green loop here. And this is um, a gentleman called Maim Mahouli, who is actually the first Arab Palestinian employee of the Department of Antiquities. Um, and he also ends up in Libya working for the department under CN Johns. Um, and here is one of the examples, I think, of where looking at these networks at the level of um, uh, indigenous, of local workers, as well as at the level of um, colonial administrators and archaeologists, adds some kind of texture to uh, a kind of a, a social history of the way archaeology is performed in this region, in this period. Abdul Husseini, um, Abdeslam al-Husseini seems to have quite a positive experience of being in Libya. He stays for a long time. His presence is very visible in terms of um, being involved in publications and things like this. He occupies several different roles, either excavating or in museums. Naim Mahouli has a very different experience. There are a number of letters um, which still exist, which um, attest to him really not liking being in Libya. He doesn't experience it as a place that has amazing uh, Phoenician and Roman remains the way that other some other archeologists do, including Bramke who, does, who, who comes and excavates in Cyrenica when he's, over, when he's at the American University of Beirut. For Mahouli, um, even though he has the common language of Arabic, which presumably is one of the reasons that the Palestinian archaeologists were being recruited for Libya, um, he doesn't find any cultural affinity with the Libyans that he's working with. He's lonely, he's bored, he's writing home to say how, um, how much he spends his evenings um, either just carrying on with work or preparing his food. And he is actually, unlike some of the other um, uh, 
Palestinian archaeologists who kind of associate their archaeology with the national cause of Palestine. Um, he is actually continues for several years to write to his former Jewish colleagues from the Palestinian Department of Antiquities, um, who are now, of course, setting up the Israeli Department of uh, Israeli um, Antiquities Authority, begging them to try and intercede with the government um, to allow him back. Um, the State of Israel didn't permit Palestinian refugees who um, in many cases thought they were only leaving for sort of a, a couple of weeks or a couple of months during the conflict to come back into the State of Israel. Um, so he was writing to people like Emmanuel Bendor um, uh, and Lipa Sukanik um, to say, please, please intercede with the, with the immigration authorities to allow me back into the country and find me a job in your new department. I really want to come home. Why is there this difference? Maybe partly this is about personality. Um, I think it might also be something to do with the fact that Al Husseini is from um, an elite, uh, quite a cosmopolitan uh, Muslim family. Um, whereas Mahuli um, was one of the regional inspectors. He'd been always based up in either Acre or Nazareth um, rather than in Jerusalem, which was a much busier place. Um, and he seems to have been in some ways a, a bit of a homebody really, um, uh, but he was also from a Christian family. He was from a largely Christian uh, Greek Orthodox village called, um, or town now, called um, uh, Kfar Yisuf. Uh, so to summarize what I think we um, can look at here is a way in which um, thinking about the archeology span of Cyprus in the colonial era and kind of critically interrogating what that colonialism means. On the one level, Cyprus is in a regional network of archeologists from Britain who often know each other from universities, from institutions in Britain, and where there is a certain amount of movement and interchange um, at the senior level um, or between excavations, but that also if we look to um, perhaps more subaltern levels, we can also see this network functioning. And um, although this is a, a, an extraordinary example in that we have this sort of moment when all of these archeologists become refugees and where there is a big rupture in the continuity of this department, we can see other forms of continuity amongst these archeologists um, at the network level that permits them to carry on in archeological careers, um, uh, even, even though they are separated from the institutions that they had in, in some cases been parts of for, for decades. Um, to absolutely finally wrap up, um, I think the questions that remain in this, um, in this subject though, are what that means in Cyprus. Um, so from my perspective, as a historian of Palestine, these are indigenous archeologists who are displaced and then use these networks to um, travel throughout the region. What does that look like for Cypriots involved in the Department of Antiquities and Archaeology on Cyprus, how would they have seen Stefan um, as a refugee who was um, taking this opportunity to remain within his field? Or is he somebody who is very much facilitated by a colonial presence? Um, how, 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 would, how did they view him? Um, uh, COVID meant that um, some of the archives that I wanted to access to do this um, didn't happen, but um, I'd be really interested to hear from other contributors to this conference and to other papers from the collection, um, how they think uh, this kind of um, relationship might, if he hadn't um, passed away so young, have evolved. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>